So it really is an incredible miracle that I'm even sitting here talking with you today. No matter how tough life gets, you can always find little moments of joy um, and gratitude in your day. Gratitude plus joy is resilience. It's such a simple equation. It's one plus one equals two. But I think that people really get stuck in their loss and their grief sometimes. Joy is like the act like more active than just happy like i can say i'm happy because i got to eat a hamburger today right but when you think about the word joy like that's a feeling that encompasses you small steps are still beautiful and you might feel like you're failing but with failure comes growth resilience is about being flexible because you're gonna fall off the path and you're gonna have to get back up and you're gonna have to find a new path. Welcome to Stories and Stanza, a weekly podcast bringing you real stories from creators and speakers around the world. Hi Jessica, how are you? I'm doing so good. How are you tonight? Uh, my, my day actually. Day actually, yeah. yeah my night, your day. Yeah, How's your morning going so far? <laughs> also, also, I am on, in the next day, so I am in the future. <laughs> Yes, you so, are. It's so odd. I don't think I've ever talked to anybody in your time zone before. So this is new for me and I'm pretty excited about it. So thank you for having me today. Thanks for joining. Or us. tomorrow. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a lovely day here in Melbourne. And I went for a walk and it, it's really uh, sunny and Melbourne's weather can be very fickle. It can be cloudy. It can be rainy and Within half an hour, it can change to sunny and beautiful. So today is just really looking great. And it's a wonderful start of the day. And I'm looking forward to speak to you on stories and stanza. So before we get into our conversation, could you tell us about yourself, please? Uh, yeah. So my name is Jessica Renfelt. I founded my company Resilience Coaching by Jessica Ann last fall. And... It came out of a really long fight for my life, really. I'm a mom of three girls. They're all adults and they're beautiful and amazing souls that I'm proud to have had a part of that in. My oldest is 28, my second is 23, and my youngest is nine or 20 now, actually. Um, my 20-year-old still lives with me, so I have a 20-year-old roommate, which is both good and bad. <laughs> and then both of my other girls live within a mile of me. And it's really important to our family to get together every Sunday. So we do that every Sunday. I'm in the middle of writing a book right now. It's about my, how I found this beautiful life that I have now. And it's called Dancing in the Shower, Cultivating Radical Resilience to Live a Life You Love. And it's all about my journey from childhood and learning about gratitude and resilience up through almost losing my life multiple occasions in the last six years and getting through that and how along the way I was able to uncover this deep-seated gratitude that really fueled joy and ultimately an a resilience that can't even be explained. It's quite amazing. So I look forward to uh, hearing from you and uh, getting to know about your journey and uh, how you uh, work with people. Before getting there, I wanted to ask you something. So this podcast is called Fail With Me. And the mm -hmm. reason behind that is I had a difficult couple of years and I was under the impression that I was failing and there was a uh, physical uh, illness uh, a little bit of challenges with uh, mental health and it, it went on for a couple of years and when I came out stronger from the other side and I wanted to do something meaningful and I wanted to look back and talk about failures openly and see what is the message underneath. Where is the true resilience that we build from there? 
and let people attach to that concept so that's the theme behind fail with me it's the first thing i wanted to ask you is and hear from you is how does that idea sit with you i think it's beautiful and i wholeheartedly believe that failure um helps us to grow one of my favorite books is actually called fail fast fail often and when i first read it like when i first read the title i'm like why on earth would I want to fail? This is a ridiculous concept. But then as I I read it, I realized that there's so much learning to be had, learning and growth to be had when you fail. And failure is actually a really beautiful thing. It's vulnerable and it's raw. And um, it's just... It's like when you break your arm and you have a fracture and then that fracture heals over, that fracture is stronger in that place that it healed than it was prior to when that fracture um, built up all the bone. It's stronger now, right? It's a way for us to become stronger individuals. And also in failure, I think that it breeds empathy for others who are struggling which I think is a beautiful thing to have. Not everybody has empathy because they haven't had struggles in life, but those who have had struggles are incredible, beautiful souls um, because I think that they're, they can see other people's struggles and be empathetic to them and kind. So yes. it's a beautiful concept. Thank you so much. And when I look back now, when I was going through that, my my fa- difficult phase, what I realized is that I was very alone. Like both me and my wife, we went through that uh, period and I didn't have anyone to connect to. So mm-hmm. which is why the idea behind the podcast is that it lends a soothing voice and it tells people mm-hmm. that it's okay to struggle. And there are many other people in that space and it helps them uh, feel the strength to go on and uh, build their uh, life. You survived uh, cancer and stroke and you had a heart transplant. Let's hear your personal journey first. Yeah, so it really is an incredible miracle that I'm even sitting here talking with you today. Back in 2016, I started feeling just not myself, incredibly exhausted, tired. I was struggling at work, had really bad brain fog. My legs were swelling. My abdomen was swelling. And I I went to my physician on multiple occasions and she thought that maybe my thyroid was off. So she adjusted my thyroid medication. Still, the symptoms didn't go away. So then she thought, maybe you're struggling to breathe because you're having some asthma. So let's put you on a medication to help with that. I was still struggling to breathe and all those other symptoms were still there. The exhaustion got so horrible that I was waking up after conference calls has en- had ended and I had been drooling on my desk <laughs> and I had no recollection of what had been talked about for the last 30 minutes. But an exhaustion that deep, just like you just fall asleep at a moment's notice and that's what was happening. So after multiple conversations with my primary doctor, I finally slowed down enough to listen to my body. I was in corporate America. I was traveling all the time, working 60 to 80 hour work weeks and really trying to climb that corporate ladder, right? Be successful, be a good mom, be a good wife, do all the things. And it finally got to the point I laid down one night. I was in Chicago at a meeting. I laid down in my hotel room that night and my lungs started like gurgling, like they were making a rattling noise. And I was like, oh my goodness, something's really wrong. I should probably go to the doctor again. And a few days later, we went to the zoo here in Salt Lake City. My oldest daughter wanted to go there for her birthday. I think it was her 
18th or 19th birthday, somewhere in there. Anyway, the zoo is configured in such a way that all the exhibits are downhill. And when I tried to get back uphill that day, it just wasn't happening. I'd walk about five feet. I couldn't breathe anymore. I had to lean on my husband, let my breath catch up. But in those moments of just allowing myself to take the time to listen to my body is what I was feeling is this pressure build behind my heart. And as I sat there, the pressure slowly lessened as time went on. And I did that. We took probably about 10 breaks on our way out of the zoo. And my my husband put his foot down. He's like, Jessica, you are getting into the doctor on Monday and you are going to tell her you have a heart issue. I've been researching it and this is it. We have to just, we have to tell her what she needs to do. So that's what we did on Monday. I went to the doctor and I told her, I said, I have a heart problem. She hooked me up to an EKG machine. And that's when she saw that I had low voltage, which essentially means that your heart's not putting all the voltage through it that it should and that there's something wrong. So she referred me to get a stress echo test at the hospital, which I did. I turned out, my heart turned out to appear so bad on the radiology scan that they wouldn't even let me get on a treadmill and instead called the on-call cardiologist to come and look at my echo. And he's my guardian angel. He knew immediately what was wrong and had me diagnosed before I left the hospital. He didn't talk to me directly. He told the radiologist, she's got this, don't let her leave the state. She has to get into my office tomorrow, tell her she's going to spend eight hours, and then I'll call her within a half hour. And I wasn't taking that for an answer. He didn't tell me what the diagnosis was. I was like, I cannot leave without you giving me an idea of what's going on. He's this is what he thinks you have. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew by the sadness in this man's eyes that it was something really horrible that I was about to have to fight. And I got as far as my car, called my husband and completely collapsed over my car. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach, right? When somebody tells you that there's something wrong with your heart, you hope that there was nothing wrong. But at the same time, you're also a little bit relieved to find out that you're not crazy. There really was something wrong. Uh, Dr. Afshar did exactly what he said, had me called within 30 minutes. And then... The adventure started. I did all of the testing to conclude that indeed I did have what's called cardiac AL amyloidosis. It's a disease that's very rare. It creates misfolded proteins inside the bone marrow, and then those proteins go to the body and do what they need to do. But when they're misfolded, they stick together. They get really sticky. And because they stick together, they start sticking in your organs. And it causes organ failure. And for me, those sticky amyloid deposits deposited themselves in my heart, uh, my kidneys, a little bit in my liver, my pancreas, my GI system, even in my tongue. It was crazy. So the treatment for that is actually chemotherapy, the same chemotherapy that you do for multiple myeloma and or a stem cell transplant. I did both. I did a I did one round of chemo and then they immediately did a stem cell transplant which is really diff difficult procedure to undergo. They take your stem cells, first of all, which is exhausting. And then they give you chemotherapy that kills your, like all of your cells. And then they re-deliver those stem cells back into your body in the hopes that they'll grow and create new healthy cells in your body. But the process takes about three weeks where you're pretty much isolated in the hospital 
it was really hard for my family to come. They, when they did come, they had to dress in PPE, cover their shoes, wear gloves, everything. So human contact went away. But something that happened in that hospital impressed even myself. I every day made the decision that I was going to get out of bed and I was going to find something that would bring me joy no matter how sick I was. And I was really sick. So it's what I would do is I get out of bed, I'd straighten out my cupboards, I'd open up the cupboard that had my clothes in it, I'd grab my clothes, I'd grab my phone, I'd go into the bathroom, let the nurses know where I was going so they didn't have to worry about me. <laughs> go in the bathroom and I turn on the shower and I turn on some music and I would get in there, let the hot water run on my body and I'd listen to music and I would just sway. And it was like this realization that made me realize that no matter how tough life gets, you can always find little moments of joy um, and gratitude in your day. And that's actually why my book's called Dancing in the Shower is it's my life's little reminder that no matter how bad it gets, there's always little bits of gratitude that can be found. We just have to look for them. So after the stem cell transplant, I thought I was going to be cured. I thought that was going to be the end of it. Life was going to go on and it was going to be great. They retested my blood I think it was about two months out and they decided that the stem cell transplant had done a really good job. It hadn't put me into hematologic remission. It hadn't gotten rid of the disease entirely. So I did another 10 months of outpatient chemo, which was really hard for me. I felt like I had kept such a positive attitude up until that point, but I was so... I was so disappointed to find out that I was going to have to do another 10 months of chemo. I, an incredible sadness came over me and I felt like I was failing because I wasn't putting on this happy face and having this really positive attitude. And I was sad and I was, I just, I don't know. I was grieving a life that I had lost and what kind of life was I going to have? And it was just a really difficult time and I ended up getting on an antidepressant for some help for a couple months until my chemo finally ended in November. We decided to stop it because my body was just so sick and hurting and we decided that we wanted to get a second opinion at Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic's a really big hospital system here in the U.S. and they're really the thought leaders on amyloid doses. So I agreed and we went there in February. So I'd been off treatment for four months-ish, went in February and I got the best news ever. They're like, you're in hematologic remission. Do you keep on doing what you're doing? Go live your life. Your heart's going to get better over time. If the disease ever comes back, come back to us because we get to have, we get to do all of the trials. And you would probably get to be on some sort of trial for the, for treatment of the disease. And I thought, no way is this disease coming back, <laughs> but thank you for the offer. And we went home, I was super excited. I did the best I could that year to really get out in the mountains and hike and, and live my life. And boy, I was excited and gratitude and grateful and full of joy and just really loving life, but I started to slow down. Um, by 2019, I was starting to feel like I had heart failure again. My legs were swelling. I was struggling to get up in high elevations again, short of breath, exhausted. And the hospital visits started happening again. So I was going in the hospital is what would happen is my heart wasn't strong enough. It was stiff. And it when it's stiff, it doesn't have enough pump action to pump out all the extra fluid in your body. So you fill up with extra fluid and that makes it hard to breathe. It's miserable. And 
they would put me in the hospital and they would get rid of the extra fluid through diuresis. So they'd give me a diuretic, a water medicate, like a medication through IV that would get, help me, my kidneys work and get all the extra water out of my body. And they'd make sure all my drugs were fine tuned and they'd send me home. I was going in about every month to month and a half that year. And I thought, man, is this really what my life's going to be? And I had hoped that my heart would remodel and start feeling better, but I was only feeling worse. And in January of 2020, it was January 2nd, I had just set my New Year's resolutions on my vision board. I was all excited about the year. And I was working on hemming a pair of pants for my dad. They were too long for him. And I was standing at my dining room table when I got this incredibly sharp pain in the back of my head that made me feel like I lost vision. And then the shooting pain went in down into my neck. And the next thing I know, I'm falling and I can't do anything about it. I must have blacked out for a few minutes. And when I came through, I was scared because I was trying to move and I couldn't seem to yell out. All I could make is like a like a loud moaning noise, which thankfully my youngest daughter did finally hear. I was hoping it would, I remember thinking, I hope it's Clarissa that hears because Clarissa had just gotten her nursing assistant certification. I thought she could handle a medical crisis better than my youngest. But my youngest showed up and she realized, oh no, mom's in trouble. And she went and got her sister and her dad. <laughs> and my middle daughter that had her CNA certification, her certified nurses assistant certification, she's when I she'd asked me to talk and I couldn't, gibberish was coming out and she realized and mom might be having a stroke. And so she started doing the test, sticking the tongue out, asking me to smile, stuff like that. And I just couldn't do it. And their dad was in disbelief. He's like, stop faking it. <laughs> this isn't funny. He thought I was playing a joke, which is a horrible joke to play. But she's like, no, dad, she's having a stroke. We need to get her to the hospital. So he literally threw me over his shoulder carried me out to our pickup truck and drove me the block over to the hospital, knowing that was going to be a lot faster than an ambulance ride. And they, because of such quick response time, it saved my brain. A stroke that massive could have completely debilitated me, but they administered something called TPN, which is like an anticoagulant, like a heavy duty anticoagulant. So it breaks up the clot, clot with a medication. They administered that and then they sent me by ambulance to the big trauma hospital in the valley. And they actually went with a catheter inside my brain and they scooped out the clot and pulled it out. And that night was so hard. I laid there and every 15 minutes, the nurse would wake me up. What's your name? Where are you at? Why are you here? And every 15 minutes, I was reminding myself that I had a stroke, which was really hard for me. And I could feel that my mouth wasn't responding to whatever I would say. I couldn't get up to go to the bathroom. So I was using a bedpan, which was really humiliating for me. And I remember my husband asking the doctor, was she going to walk or talk again? And the doctors, we don't know at this point. But a day later, I got up and I drug my gimp foot around that hall and made a loop around the nurse's station. And I've just never stopped walking since that time. It took me several months to get a regular gait back, but I was so determined not to let this bring me down after everything I'd been through up till that point, this was not going to take me down. And I fought really hard to get my speech, my walking, the strength back in my hand. It's still a little bit weird, but we make do. 
But it was at that point in time where the doctors are like, oh goodness, her heart is so bad that it allowed blood to pool because again, it can't push that blood through my heart. So blood pooled in there and that's why I made a clot that went into my brain and caused a stroke. So that's when they decided I needed to go on the heart transplant list, which is a really big ordeal. You have to go through weeks and weeks of testing, including psych evaluations, stress tests, blood tests, antibody tests, anything you can imagine. It takes a couple of weeks before you finally get placed on the transplant list. And in my mind, I thought, oh my goodness, I'll have a transplant so quick. Like it's just going to happen really quick. I'm on the list. Some Somebody will pass and they'll donate their heart and I'll have a heart without any issues. I waited 15 months outside of the hospital as my body got gradually sicker and sicker in and out of the hospital quite frequently for diuresis, um, other things that came up as well. And it got to a point where I was struggling so bad to breathe and to keep that water weight off that they decided it was time to go into the intensive care unit, the cardiac intensive care unit. I waited for 78 days in there. Like I literally lived in the cardiac ICU for 78 days. It was such a strange feeling because cardiac rehab would come and walk me every day. And I'd say hi to the nurses and the doctors and the housekeeping staff and I think, oh my gosh, these people are like my neighbors and this is the little apartment that I'm living in. It got, it was such a weird experience to be in there. And that was difficult. Like the time, the length of time was hard, of course, but it was also really difficult because it was during COVID that this was happening. And on that same floor, they had positive air low rooms where COVID patients were kept. And there were several nights where I heard families weeping the loss of their loved ones that they had lost to COVID. And so being around death like that was really difficult for those 78 days as well. So it was like a whole nother component. We are already afraid. I don't know if I was ever afraid of dying, but very cognizant that it could happen. And then to hear and see other people dying so much during that time was a difficult experience. But on September 9th, so I'm actually almost on my three year anniversary, just three days away. So this is a great way to celebrate it. I got my heart. The most incredible gift one could ever receive from a complete stranger who I'll never ever get to think, but ooh, it's a super surreal experience. And I will tell you that I am living life for two people. When I talk about this heart, it's not just mine, it's that person's as well. And I do things that bring this heart so much joy. I hike. I have fulfilled so many curiosities that I had in my life. I love to fly fish. I go backpacking. I go hiking. I have visited foreign countries. All of these things since I got my heart and because of someone else's gift to me that I, it just never would have happened. But I am living life to the absolute fullest. After I got my heart, I realized how how important it was for me to help other people wherever their journey was. But I feel a lot of people are experiencing loss and grief in their life. And I love to be able to help them. It started out with just being a good friend and support to people who were waiting for their hearts as well. But then it's expanded into telling my story to other people who might be listening and that I can help too. Last year, I decided to leave corporate America. I had lost passion for it and 
really wasn't fitting in with my own value system, which was I wanted to be a heart-centered leader in some way or another. And whether that meant changing changing jobs or what I'm doing now, which is create my own company where I can do it every day, I was going to do it. And so I left corporate in September and I thought, oh my goodness, I have no idea what I'm doing. I hope it goes well. And then things just have worked out. Like almost immediately, I found somebody who would publish my book. Um, so I've been writing since last fall. Um, I'll, it should be released the beginning of the year. I got a little slowed down. My mom passed away in January. It hit me hard, but writing a book. And then I ran into a business coach who really helped me believe that I could be exactly what I wanted to be. And that was to be a life coach who really focused on life or loss and grief and how to get unstuck from that cycle and really move forward in gratitude and joy so that they can really live the life that they're meant to live. So I know that's a lot, but where I'm at right now in my resilience coaching, I feel a really extreme passion for it. I'm super excited about it and look forward to what the future might bring. It's definitely been a difficult road. I had no idea that it would be so hard to start my own company and kind of get that traction, but it's definitely been worth all the people that I've been able to talk to and help along the way. Thank you for sharing that. I think I need a moment to process the emotions that I went through when I was listening in. I don't think I can put it into words. It's amazing that you could come back from all these different phases of struggle that you went through. And I can only imagine what it must have been like. So thank you, first of all, for sharing the heartfelt story. And what you said, like that one of the things that deeply touched me is that you are now leaving the life of two people, yours and the person who donated their heart. So I, I just don't know what to say. And this is for the first time I, I'm talking to someone who has been to such an amazing journey. And thank you for enriching my podcast with your life story. I, I want to know a lot more from you about your resilience coaching. Okay. And you touched upon this when you were talking that you were in the corporate life and my my, my day job also is, is part of corporate and I have taken slight backseat in terms of where I was a couple of years ago because I was not not feeling comfortable with that com cutthroat competitions and sales and marketing yes. and the traveling yes. all, all around. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to share a small piece here that my I remember my daughter was uh, just in, in preschool and I was traveling all around Australia here and there. And I was just never there. Like I was getting up mm. and I was leaving and then I, didn't know when I will come back and where I would be in the week, etc. And they uh, told my daughter to say something about her family in her kindergarten. And she said mm -hmm. that I love my dad, but he's always leaving. And he says I'll be right back, but he is never there. So I, I have that mounted in a frame and it it told me that I need to take a turn and I need to move away from that corporate burnout to a more stable work-life balance, which is a, a conscious decision that I took. And I think it has redefined my life. And so you also said something very similar. You had a corporate life and now you are a resilience coach. How do you see that transformation? Was it, you, you talked about your health journey. 
but emotionally and changing your perspective from where you were to where you are now i want to hear your version of it yeah when you spend 78 days in the icu you think about a lot of things right and it was there that i had really made the decision that i needed to do something that would allow me to help other people and i didn't necessarily know how that looked i came back to work after my heart transplant in 12 weeks i only took 12 weeks off and then came back and the mounting stress and pressure to make cells while I was trying to balance doctor's office visits and also like my own mental health, like it just got to the point where I had this realization, if I'm going to be able to keep my stress low, which is important when you have, what's well, important for everybody, but it's particularly important when you have an organ transplant, then I need to make a change. And then it just developed. There were a lot of leadership changes over the course of time that I had been in the most recent company that I worked with. I think I went through five CEOs and five direct leaders. And then they had realigned roles within our sales team. And it just, I don't know, I felt like the universe was telling me, it's time to jump. It's okay. It's time to jump. I've got your back. And this isn't a healthy environment for you. You're not happy. Who knows how long you're going to get to live your life, but you should be doing something that you love and not something that you resent and don't like showing up for every day. So it's been scary though. It has been scary, but also so incredibly rewarding. And I know I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I was going through some of the ideas that you shared with me. And I really absolutely love how you said like gratitude plus joy is resilience. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think your the, the, this is the key theme of your coaching. It is. It's such a simple equation. It's one plus one equals two. But I think that people really get stuck in their loss and their grief sometimes. And I actually saw this happen when I was a little girl. I lost my uncle when I was 10 years old and it really crushed my grandparents. It was so hard on them. And Things get relatively better over time, but I felt like they never came out of that. They literally got stuck in their grief and never really lived life joyfully after that. They were just sad all the time. And I remember thinking as a little kid, like, man, I miss my grandparents. Like, you know, that was hard for me. And I definitely didn't want to do that to my own kids. So... I tried my best to work through the sadness and the fear and the grief that I had in the loss of health that was occurring to me. And as I did that, I realized that all I needed to do was find a little bit of gratitude every day. It was the, it was started out so little. It was that dancing in the shower that I talked about. But then I started being grateful to kind nurses and physicians that treated me like a human being. I got for grateful for my friends and family who would reach out to make sure I was okay. I was super excited about cups of coffee and the smell of flowers and all the things. And I noticed that as my gratitude grew, my joy also grew. And with joy, the things that fueled joy for me, just a few things that I noticed are curiosity, like a childlike curiosity. Think of all the things that you were curious about as a child, and you just either thought that you could never do it, or you forgot about it as an adult. I brought that childhood curiosity back into my life. And with that curiosity came adventure. And 
like all those themes built on this really incredible, beautiful, joyous life I was having. And I noticed as long as I was fueling myself with gratitude and joy, that I was able to be resilient when turbulent times came. And they have come so many times. Even now I, I deal with stuff like my kidney function is struggling right now, but I'm going to make sure that I go out and get camping next weekend. And so I'm filling that joy cup again. And with that joy, that resilience just comes into play. So thank you for sharing that. One one of the questions I often ask, uh, I ask my guests that how do we truly heal and what does our healing journey look like? And it is very different for different people and i yeah. love you you said something that resetting our brain the changing mm -hmm. the way we think and mm -hmm. can you tell me some of your ideas in that space like you, you just mentioned that your uncles yeah. they are stuck in their grief cycle and mm -hmm. a lot of people that i and even my listeners they say that we often feel stuck and then we are listening mm -hmm. and we don't know how to come out of it. We are doing the same thing uh, on a yeah. day-to-day basis. Yeah. So I think first you need to know how you do want to feel, right? And But then you also need to understand how you feel now is impacting like your life. So let's say you're struggling with sadness. How, what's that affecting? Is it affecting your marriage, your parenting, your ability to be a good employee or business owner? And then, like I said, knowing where you want to be and what does that feel like? The end result, what does that feel like? You want to be happy, but what does happy mean for you? It's so important to feel like joy because joy is like the act, like, more active than just happy. Like I can say I'm happy because I got to eat a hamburger today, right? But when you think about the word joy, like that's a feeling that encompasses you. So you need to think about where you want your life to be. Do you want to be joyful? How does that feel? What does it look like? So understand where you're at, but also understand how you want to feel feel when you get to the place where you want to be. And I think by actually feeling it, it makes it easier to work towards it. It's just not a thought, but it's a feeling that you're trying to acquire. And then it's just baby steps. Like I said, maybe start. I, I know people talk about gratitude journals all the time, and it's not a new thought process at all, but I do believe in gratitude journals. It works. Pick one thing to be grateful for. Soon that turns into five. And then the next day it turns into 10. But a second piece of a gratitude journal that I think is important is, is um, having intentions in the morning that you add to that journal. So say what you're grateful for at night, but the next morning, put down an intention. I... I intend to cook healthy meals for myself, or I intend to take a walk at the park on my lunch. And then because you're setting intentions, like positive intentions, your day starts to become more positive. And I explain it as a vibration, like a higher vibration that you're setting for yourself. It's hard because when you're feeling so sad and hopeless to feel like you can even just get out of bed sometimes, but if you can just find one little thing to be grateful for and truly feel that joy that it brings you, I do feel like you do have the power within you to push past it. That is very inspiring. And thank you for sharing that uh, voice and I am working on this podcast and this one of the reasons is that giving that hope, giving that uh, to people that there can be difficult time, there can yeah. be a difficult phase 
but then mm-hmm. there is something that you can hope for and you can always walk towards that direction even if it is like small steps yeah yep for sure small steps are still beautiful and you might feel like you're failing but with failure comes growth like we said right yes. like it's just about like practice being grateful. You don't even have to say you're grateful, just practice and it probably will turn into true gratitude. Yes, and I think that wherever there is failure, there is a message. It is telling us something. Mm-hmm. And we just have to look for it. We just need to understand what it is telling. And sometimes that answer is not with us. That's why we get frustrated. But that answer is yeah. there somewhere. It is. It is. Uh, it is. and um, i think we we talked about a, a number of things and i want to hear from you that as a resilience coach do you think that as a society there are some areas where we lack awareness about resilience yes absolutely i think that people have an their minds that resilience means that you're super strong and that you're like you're just straightforward and you don't veer off the path and that's just not the case resilience is about being flexible because you're going to fall off the path and you're going to have to get back up and you're going to have to find a new path and Resilience is all about flexibility. It's not about re- rigidity at all. And that's actually what makes resilience so beautiful is that it's it's really the human experience, right? It's about failure and getting up again and learning what makes us strong. So, yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I think we covered a lot of areas in our chat today and i think we have come towards the end of our discussion so first of all i'm i'm really uh, curious about your book and when it comes to close to publishing i would love to speak to you again and because i okay. talk to a lot of writers uh, on my show so it would be I really would love amazing that. if you could come back again and this time like to talk about your book and share that with the audience and stories and stanza but before we close is there anything else you would like to say to the audience i would love to connect with you i do have a website it's at jessicaann.org I'll be announcing when my book comes out. I have a couple free giveaways. I do offer a free consultation to uncover your path towards resilience to see what you can do to make yourself live a more joyful life. For... Other than that, I really appreciate your time today and I'm grateful that you brought me on your show the things you said about why you created this show gave me chills like you have a beautiful purpose and i love it thank you and to our listeners thanks for joining us today in this amazing episode with Jessica and i'll be putting her website and her details in the description of this episode for anyone who wants to get in touch and know about uh, her work more or get into the consulting space with her as a resilience coach thank you once again for taking the time and talk to stories and stanza today thank you